Bolivaraka, hello everyone. Well, it is week three in the Shop and Save Super Rugby Pacific competition, and you all know what that means. It's the Swire Shipping Fiji and Drewers turn to host the long awaited clash with eight time champions, the Crusaders, in Laotoka this Saturday. I'm Greg Clark, and I'm going to be calling all the action alongside Sam Wikes and also Kara Karoy on Saturday. But a lot more on that later. We're coming off the back of the second Super Rugby Pacific Super Round in Melbourne, presented by Fiji Airways. And joining me to talk about that and lots more is Christy Doran, Senior Rugby Writer with TheRaw.com. Bula Varaka, Christy. How are you, mate? Bula, great to join you, Clarky. Great celebration. Isn't it brilliant that Fiji, the long-awaited Fijians are in Super Rugby? It's just added so much to the competition, hasn't it? It certainly has, and, uh, you know, we're only week uh, three into it. But let's go back to Melbourne. You were there for the three days for Super Round, so what did you make of it? Oh, well, it started off with a couple of great spectacles on Friday night, didn't it? And we saw a, a brilliant clash between Melbourne, the Melbourne Rebels and the Hurricanes, of course, dominated by an incident with Artie Sevilla at half time. But on Saturday we saw... The great thing about Super Rugby, we saw Moana Pacifica uh, in the afternoon and we saw on one side of the, the ground there at Amy Park dominated by the Moana Pacifica fans. And then a game later, we saw the Fijian Drua, really just the colour, the voice, everything that we want to see about rugby really come to fruition because the Drua, not only were they there, they were up 17-10 against the Waratahs, a good side, and we saw big hits, we saw something and we heard something that we've not ever heard before in Super Rugby, which was a real ooh with every time that there was a humongous shot put on by the Drua. And I don't think I've ever heard anything quite like it in a Super match. Clark, you've called many games. Have you seen anything like it? No, they're the best fans in the world, you know, from sevens all the way through to 15s and now the Fijiana is... Uh, uh, we've known for a long time that they'll travel anywhere and uh, they make some noise. And if you want noise, well, tune in on Saturday afternoon because we are going to be in Lautoka and it's going to be chock-a-block there. And uh, 10, 11,000 will probably sound like 50,000. So, yeah, it was a wonderful occasion, great atmosphere, no doubt about that. But let's uh, just go through the games. Um, I, I thought the Crusaders were obviously fantastic, pumping the Highlanders 52-15 in the opening game. So the Drua know what to expect in, in La Taker on Saturday. A hiccup for the Crusaders in week one, but uh, they got back into the, their mode on uh, the weekend. Yeah, they certainly did, and they did it without Scott Razor Roberts. And last year we saw Razor pop up in Fiji. Bula, he was wearing the straw hat around, and he, he'll come back. And we know that with the Crusaders, their draw cards everywhere that they go because there's all blacks littered throughout that side. They started to show what they're made of. They've got X Factor written about them. You know, when you've got someone like a Richie Moanga at 10, David Havili at 12, guys like uh, Severo Reese, and we saw him play a big part on, on Friday evening as well. He scored, he scored early. It's going to be an enthralling match. And the one thing that we can't, prepare for and we don't know how it will take effect is the humidity in Fiji of course the Crusaders are the favorites because they're the favorites pretty much every time that they walk out onto a footy ground but the heat is going to bring a lot of teams unstuck and the Crusaders are the first side that's going to experience it so good luck yeah indeed We'll talk about that later and you mentioned Cebu Reese wouldn't it be amazing if the Drua down the track can uh, can attract uh, all of those uh, Fijian players to actually stay in the islands and, and play super rugby. It would be a super team, but that's for the future. Now, the Hurricanes, they got a real fright uh, from the Rebels. Uh, the Canes held on to win 39-33. The Rebels had their chance to win this one and cause a huge upset. It, it wasn't to be, but I was encouraged by the Rebels. And, and so everyone should be because the, the second half performance they put on was almost New Zealand-esque. There was collisions, there was uh, a real physicality about their play and it wasn't just from the forwards, it was from the inside backs. Um, guys like Stacey Illy, who's playing in, in the midfield alongside Reese Hodge, we saw the emergence of guys like uh, Lockie Anderson who scored a, a touchdown nicely there. But 
it was the forwards off the bench that came on, guys like Pone Farmacilli and Jordan Walisi that came on and just brought a massive amount of enthusiasm. And, and importantly, what was missing a week earlier against the Western Force when they struggled in the second half, they were all very individual in how they came off looking for the one-out big players, but we saw the Rebels put in a really good, strong team performance, and that was, you could see that come to fruition. And you can't just have one or two lone rangers. It's got to be a 15-person effort, and we saw that against the Hurricanes. And now it's about backing it up against the Waratahs this week. Yeah. We saw Adi Savia, you know, um, do something stupid. I, mean, I, I love the guy as a rugby player. Um, you know, he's one of the best in the world, no, no doubt about that. And, and yeah, he was remorseful doing the throat-cutting gesture, which I know is part of one of their their, their harkers. Um, yeah, he had to get something, and he's got one week, a one-week suspension. Are you happy with that? I think it's a reasonable stand because you don't want teenagers, you don't want school kids doing that on Saturdays, looking up to one of the real idols of world rugby. I would have thought that in the last three, four years, Artie Sevilla is the most influential player in world rugby. He is a back rower that is impossible to bring down. And if you were to, it's always a fun exercise. If you could have one player and morph them into 15, which player would you have? That represents a team. Artie Sevilla would be the guy for me. He can pass like a back, run like a back, but hit like a forward. And he's just so strong over the ball. He's the most enjoyable bloke to watch play rugby, I think, in the world at the moment. One week is a fair band, though, because he's an idol. He's an idol that everyone looks up to. And you can't have your idols doing those sorts of things, I don't think. And I think family members also gave him a hard time. So I think oh, he won't funny. be doing that again. <laughs> no, anyway. no, he doesn't want to cop it. From Dad in particular. Okay, on day two in Melbourne, Chiefs beat Moana 52-29. It was never in doubt. Uh, it was a great start by, by the Chiefs. Uh, better second half by Moana, but they're a work in progress. Was it you, Clarky, that announced in the big uh, stage down at, at the southern end that it was the fastest try in Super Rugby? I think it was, what, less than nine seconds? Yeah, it was. Uh, so 12 was the previous record set in 2001. So, yeah, the opening try... Uh, Hippie for the Chiefs, yeah, nine seconds. So that's going to take some beating in future years. Oh, extraordinary. And great to see Damian McKenzie. He's played up there in the past, I think, for the for the Chiefs. And we've just seen what he can bring to a side and attack, the way that he runs the ball in two hands. He, it's great to see him back. It's great to see guys like Brody Retallick back in Super Rugby because some of these New Zealand stars have spent a year or two up in Japan. And having a Chiefs that is a strong side, that's got a strong Pacifica heritage as well, uh, it brings so much flavour to Super Rugby. I spoke with uh, Stephen Donald, you know, one, one time, great number 10 for the uh, for the Chiefs, and he has no problem with the fact that Damian McKenzie has now set the new record for point scoring in Super Rugby for the Chiefs, and he wants him at 10. No more 15. Damian McKenzie must be a 10, and that's coming from the great Beaver himself. Well, the Fijian drew a 17-10 up early in the second half, and uh, I was like uh, everyone else thinking, who flicked the switch for the Waratahs? Because all of a sudden they put on 36 unanswered points. I know who flicked the switch. It was just basically the players themselves because they went back to basics and, and didn't try and play the Fijian style of football. It's amazing what, if you, if you simplify a game plan, sometimes it comes off. We saw that with the Waratahs, but they were always going to have to outwork them because the Fijians, they, they came out. There was a huge improvement from their first up performance against Moana Pacifica. They were just rocking Amy Park with the hits that they were putting on, the physicality that they were showing, but it's so difficult to do that for 80 minutes. We saw probably the depth of the Waratahs really come to the fore when you've got guys like Charlie Gamble, Tolu Latu, who was one of the stars for the Wallabies at the 2019 World Cup. When you're able to bring on those sorts of players, it's difficult. And, and of course, discipline. It's a huge thing. And it's probably a big work on for Fiji. And we've seen the sides, the super rugby sides that have struggled with their discipline and had guys sent off the yellow cards. It's been very, very difficult for them to stay on. And we saw that in the second half when Fiji not only he had to go down to 14 players, but had to go down to 13 players, probably because one of the cruel laws in rugby, which doesn't allow for 
you know, you've got to you've got to have a scrum. You can't go down to contested scrums, uh, uncontested scrums at times. So it was difficult, and we we heard Mick Byrne lament that in his post match interview. Uh, but I think they'll be they'll be up for it against the Crusaders. First game at home in a long while. Uh, interesting to see that um, uh, Joe Tamani was a fan player of, of the match, voted by by the fans. Obviously, uh, uh, Ken Avari must have been pretty close to to being man of the match, but then he went off with uh, cramp with about twenty or thirty minutes to go. Uh, Kitioni Salawa was given the official player of the match award because his work rate is just sensational. He's a number seven that is going places, but we need more of the Ikenaveris and Salawas and Tamanis, don't we, in the Drua? Oh, we, we certainly do. But we've seen the emergence of some really talented backs, haven't we, in just recent times. And, uh, you know, the Revovos and the Massies and the, it's, uh, you know, the fullback there, um, Troisi, who was previously, I think, at the Reds as well. He was. Uh, there's there's some some real talent there. It's about fostering that. But And you made mention of Severis's name before, the great thing about the Drua is that players won't have to now leave to go overseas to start a Super Rugby career. They can be come through the pathways at the, at the Drua and the fact that they're going to be able to keep players for longer, promote them, is only not going to just benefit the Drua but benefit the Fijian, the flying, Fijian, the flying Fijians. And, and that's a threat for world rugby because the amount of athleticism, the skill that comes through the island nation – is extraordinary. Indeed. Okay, we'll talk more about the, the Drua later as we look ahead to uh, La Toka this weekend. The marquee game in Melbourne lived up to its billing. Brumby's pulling off a morale-boosting 25-20 to 20 win over the Blues. It was gutsy and a very timely win for uh, Australian rugby so early in the season. Uh, are you surprised by, by the victory? They were pipped a couple of times last year, of course, in the semi-final at Eden Park. Yeah, but, um, you know, as you know, I'm a big man for, for stats and uh, the Blues, they uh, have had the edge over over the Brumbies. And just after that first week performance by the Blues, you know, I thought on a, on a hard, dry track in, in, in Melbourne, uh, they'd probably go into it uh, as, as slow as the Brumbies. When they get all their, you know, ducks in a row, yeah, sometimes it, it may not be pretty. But, you know, they've got the guys out wide that can score the tries, but they can also, you know, work it in tight as, as well under under Laurie Fisher's guidance. And um, in that second half, they just stuck to the task, didn't they? And it was probably more their defensive effort that uh, got them home in the end. But, uh, yeah, I, I, was, I wasn't surprised, but I was thrilled by the, the Brumbies win because we need this competition to be a lot closer. We can't have the Kiwis so far ahead of the Aussies. It was a great performance from the Brumbies and the fact that they could bring on Nick White, Noah Lolisio, all of his halves pairing in the second half to control that game. They were plugging the ball in the corners and the execution might not have been there, particularly at the line out with Nick Frost coming under a bit of pressure in that second half. But we just saw the outstanding breakdown work from guys like Rory Scott, who played out of his skin, um, Darcy Swain coming on in the second half. Uh, the the replacements, like guys like Blake Shop, who you wouldn't have heard of only a couple of weeks ago, suddenly start to emerge. Reese Van Neck, another tight head prop who's been around the block a little bit in recent years, but starting to emerge as a 23 year old. It was a complete performance, and it showed the value of depth. And that was that was a great reminder for the Super Rugby competition at large, that it's not just the Kiwis that play. Yeah, indeed. And uh, keep an eye on Luke Reimer as well, who comes off the bench as a fetcher as well. He uh, can put in a big 20 minutes. He always does. Now, the final game saw the Reds uh, get off to a flyer and uh, go on with the job, thumping the force 71-20. Great effort by the Reds, but gee, the force have some major problems. I mean, it's week two and you really don't want to get pumped by a fellow Aussie team so early in the season. No, no. And look, the game was probably summed up by the, the wicked bounce that Chase Tia Tia copped straight off the, the kick restart from Jordan Pataia, who pumped the ball along and it just went a massive off break, like a Matai Mulitherin delivery that he <laughs> used to, to, to roll over. But they scored and the, and the points kept coming in. If the force were to take anything from it, they can look at that middle period of the first half where they managed to stem the bleeding 
come back. But once again, discipline was their enemy and, and you can't afford to give away penalties, uh, consecutive penalties, run the risk of yellow cards. Uh, the Reds ran riot in that second half, but it was nice to see guys like Tom Liner emerge. Uh, what a huge name he carries, the weight of Michael Liner on his shoulders. You saw Suli Vunavalu, uh, another friend of Fiji, just storm down the pitch and it looked like he'd pulled his hamstring. Thankfully, it was only cramp, but we saw a little bit of that. Guys like Tate McDermott, generally absolute uh, bunny rabbits that you don't necessarily ever see just pull up. He was struggling with cramp. We saw the, the pickle juice come out, and I'm just glad that I wasn't swallowing any of that. <laughs> and also uh, good to see James O'Connor make a, a successful return via the bench. Um, name dropping here, but uh, I watched the match with the great Michael Liner. Um, and he, he, man, he was nervous. And, uh, you know, as a father, I've uh, been there when my son's been playing and, um, uh, he, he was uh, worse than I've ever been. I tell you, um, which, which is great to see because he's still a teenager, Tom Liner. And, um, you know, under the guidance of, of the Jim Mackay and, uh, also now James O'Connor is there to mentor him as well. He could be a bolter, um, come uh, later this year. Okay, that was uh, Super Round Week 2. Long way to go in the competition. Some more great rugby on the way this weekend. So let's talk Fiji and Drua and the Crusaders. Churchill Park, Lautoka. There's been a lot of rain in uh, in Fiji. Hopefully a couple of days of sunshine will dry the pitch out. Um, and it's 3.30 p.m. Fiji time. So all of you watching in Fiji, try and get out to uh, Churchill Park because uh, it's the first home game for them last week technically was a home game but this is the first one in, in fiji so uh, we saw the drua almost knock over the chiefs last year almost knock over the highlanders on uh, home soil so what lessons have they learned from those two narrow losses well we saw that in race out to to fast starts in both those matches and we saw them race out to a fast start against the waratahs too just last week so it's about managing an 80 minute performance and yes there's going to be times when the Fijians uh got that momentum when the crowd the vocal crowd is right behind them it's about managing to to hold and keep that momentum for as long as possible and when you don't have it guys like Caleb Munts just plugging the corners and finding touch so that the the Crusaders who have some lethal way up the outside of backs aren't able to capitalise on what might be a broken defensive line. Um, they've got to play smart rugby, but they've then got to take their chances. And I wouldn't completely rule out the Fijians from from giving the, the, the guys from Canterbury a bit of a fright here because we know that it's going to be humid and, and no side. It's just physically impossible for teams to manage to play for 80 minutes at such a high level. Lack of consistency was a problem for the Fiji and Drua in their initial year last year um, and their so-called home games. Many of them were played on Australian soil because of uh, COVID. But when they went away and when they went to New Zealand, um, they just didn't switch on. And uh, the Crusaders pumped them 61-3 to last year. So the, the, the Drua will be hurting from that. Um, and, and I can't see that scoreline um, certainly happening this week. But the good news is that... Uh, Canavera is going to be okay. Uh, Johnny Atiko, uh, uh, the Drua have lost another prop and um, they're really struggling at the moment because they've had um, some unfortunate injuries in the front row division. So scrum time, you know, is still a work on. Line out is still, still a work on, but possession is, is the key. And uh, I like Marcy. Uh, Rubova, we haven't really seen him get the opportunities he had in midfield last year. Uh, some of some of Vodre is um, you know stepping up on the wing because, as you know, there's no uh, Humbossi. So uh, it's just a matter of um, going out there and turning it on for the fans and riding off the back of that wonderful support in Lautoka. Oh yeah, and they've got an absolute general in Frank Lamani who is electric around the breakdown. He's composed. He's got the leadership, and he's got the runs on the board. He's done this time and time again. So a lot of the play will be off him. Uh, a lot of the counter attack will be off him too. It's it's about making sure that they take those opportunities. I, I'm excited by it. And um, you made mention of uh, the hooker there, the captain, and and it and it changed when he went off in the second half against the Waratahs. If he can stay on for 50, 55 minutes, 
uh, he'll be a huge, huge inclusion. He he described it and he spoke to Matt's interview as he had cramp in both his legs and he had never had it before. And it tells you a little bit about the conditions that, that were on Saturday evening. It was a warm night down there. Well, it's going to be even warmer on Saturday, I imagine. It certainly will be. Um, and the the other player I, I should mention as well is uh, Ravi Talmanda on on the wing. His work rate is uh, pretty good. He goes looking for the ball. So they've got some finishes, but they need the pill. Uh, Crusaders have always had great support in Fiji. Maybe not as much this weekend, but there's one thing about Fiji and fans, Christy, uh, and you know it. Um, they they just love the game, and uh, they'll be cheering for both teams um, uh, when there's good rugby. Yeah, and one of the things that we've got to be mindful of is that Super Rugby, the missing piece of Super Rugby for so long has been the lack of voice and the lack of Fijian flair. And it is, Fiji is not going to be the finished product. This is just the start of something that's really special here. And, and I really hope that their inclusion in the rugby championship doesn't happen in four or five years down the track, that it happens in two years down the track. I think it should be the number one priority of Sansa is how do we get Fiji involved in the rugby championship, speed up their development, continually allow them to come up against some of the best teams and players in the world. And that's not just at an international level, but it's also at a super rugby level. And Wherever they go, we hear them and, and it brings smiles to people's faces. And regardless of the result on Saturday afternoon, we will hear them through our television screens. And it is a great spectacle and product to show the world. And just on the flying Fijians, of course, they're in the same pool as the uh, Wallabies. Uh, at the Rugby World Cup in France later this year. Simon Rawa-Louis, who you know, I know, because of his uh, job as assistant coach of the the Wallabies, he's now the head coach, a bit like Eddie Jones. He hasn't got um, a lot of time to to work with the uh, the boys, but, of course, he has been involved with Fiji Rugby since moving on from the Wallaby job. So, um, you know, it's not, not as if they're bringing someone in overnight. He's, he's been there for quite a while. Indeed, and I asked Namani Ndolo last week what did he thought about Samu Rao Louis' inclusion and, and appointment as the head coach, and he said this is the best thing for Fijian rugby in a long time. And he said that because for a long time the flying, v, the flying Fijians have had uh, guys from overseas, Benakota most recently, um, uh, Mackay before that, um, be head coaches. Well, no, now we've got one of our own as a head coach, and that can be – a very powerful thing because Simon, more than anyone else, will understand what it's like to be a Fijian, to be a flying Fijian, to understand not just the Fijian flair that they bring, but this was a guy that was a, a big back row in his own right, understood forward play. And he was probably, if you look at the Wallabies of 2019, the aspect that probably achieved the most for the Wallabies and was the most a successful element of their play was their forwards play, their set piece play, their line out play. If he can bring that structure, uh, that discipline to the flyer Fijians, well, they could be a great shock for a, a nation like Wales. Um, and, and perhaps we see them make a quarter final, which would be long awaited and much celebrated. Indeed. And of course, he's uh, being assisted by Glenn Jackson and Daryl Gibson. So a couple of uh, handy backs in their day. Uh, OK, tip time, mate, though, as we rush through the rest of uh, week three. Chiefs and Highlanders in their Hamilton. Hard to go for the Highlanders after their two opening matches. Oh, the fact that the Chiefs are going to be back at home, I, I can't imagine that anyone's getting close to them. In Melbourne, it's the Rebels and the Waratahs. Uh, we know that the, the Waratahs will front up. Um, it's a matter now of the Rebels gaining some consistency and backing it up, as you said earlier on. Yeah, I think the thing that gives the Waratahs the, the, the benefit here is that the Waratahs were a bit nervy that first week, but we saw what they can do. And those nerves, uh, they're now no longer there. The Shackers have been broken by that victory over the Fijians. I think the Waratahs, just with their depth, will be too classy. Yeah, and, um, you know, we're all uh, being uh, uh, there on Saturday calling the, the Drua, uh, we being the so I guess at the stadium, uh, we'll be hoping for a great match, but the Crusaders will start uh, favourite there, no doubt, in uh, La Toka. Wellington, Hurricanes and the Blues. The Kiwis are pumping this up as being their marquee match, and, and, and rightly so. 
it should be a cracker. Oh, it should be great. I'll tell you what, the the one team that's pretty happy about the Artie Sevilla one-week ban is the Blues because the loss of Artie probably tips the scales in, in the Blues' kind of way, I think. Um, the Blues, they'll be seeding uh, following that defeat. You don't want another one consecutively. I think the Blues will, will win by a try. And the Brumbies and the Reds, the All-Aussie Affair in Canberra, uh, in week one, the Reds were, I think, missing, well, I know they were missing 14, maybe 15 players through injury, which is in, quite incredible to know what has gone on in the in, in the preseason. A lot of bad luck there, but they didn't play like a, um, well, not quite a second string, but, you know, they, they had a lot of players still to come back la- last week. So uh, they'll gain a lot of confidence uh, when they head to, uh, to Canberra, but the Brumbies at home, their first home game, gee, it's going to be tough for the Queenslanders. Oh, I'll tell you what, if you're the Brumbies, how are you going to win this game? We know that the Reds have got an electric back line. They've got guys like Jordan Pataira and Hunter Paisami, Tate McDermott. They've got a selection headache at 10, but this game's not going to be one in the back, so it's going to be one up front. And if I'm Stephen Larkin and I'm Laurie Fisher, I'm going, well, where am I targeting? And I'm targeting the missing pieces of the Queensland puzzle, which is up in the tight five. And I think that they'll keep this tight and they'll keep it structured. And they'll try to maul and scrum the Reds to death. Horse and Moana in Perth. Toss of the coin stuff here. Who's going to turn up on the night after two big losses uh, in Melbourne last weekend? Well, we saw the, the the Reds do what the Force needed to do this week, and, and that is respond. They were embarrassed against the Hurricanes, the Reds, a week earlier. They managed to turn it around. And teams are never as bad or as never as good as people think. They're always probably in the middle. I get the feeling like the force might just have a little bit too much. They'll be they'll they'll front up for this one. Moana Pacifica, if they get out to a good start though, it'll really test the mental fortitude of the force, which has been the the big area that Simon Cron is trying to address at the force at the moment. Well, that's week three. Looking forward to to that. Uh, and Christy, uh, really enjoying uh, what, what you're putting out on the raw.com. Uh, t- tell us about uh, your role there and, and uh, you know, what makes you tick week to week. Well, after six, seven years at News Corp, great to be able to talk about not just the action that's happening, but tell some more stories about the rugby players that are really the, the, the face of rugby in Southern Hemisphere in the Southern Hemisphere. So, uh, look, it's great seeing guys like Dave Parecki, the new Wallabies defence coach, Brett Hodgson at the Waratahs at Daceville. Just yesterday, he was a um, a very uh, well familiar face for someone like a Mark Nwanganitawasi who used to watch him at Leichhardt Oval. Now he's going to be potentially calling him his defence coach for the Wallabies. But great to be heavily involved in rugby because there's some great stories at the moment. There's some great... Uh, aspects of the game that need to be ce- need to be celebrated, and and it it's a bit of a missing piece at the moment. Media coverage in Australia on rugby union, and it's it's really nice to be able to fill part of that void. But hopefully, if we can continue continue to see some exciting games, um, we can see some some fans like what we're going to see this weekend at Churchill Park. Uh, we'll have rugby back in the headlines, and that's really important. And. Uh- Give uh, the Roar a plug. Uh, how are all of our Fijian viewers going to follow you? Well, raw.com.au, of course, on Twitter. Uh, but I'm looking forward to watching Saturday's game. It's going to be a cracker. There will be a report on that. See what I have to say about the Fijians, I suppose. But more than that, it's great to have guys like Mick Byrne of high-quality coaching quality at the Fijian draw because they really are the missing piece of Super Rugby and and their arrival in the Pacific competition is probably 25 years too late, but it's there, and, and now we can celebrate it. And with that shirt, you're welcome in Fiji for any of the games, so hopefully we'll see you either at La Toka or, or Suva in 2023. Um, everyone's saying there's six home games, but that's in the regular season. And, uh, I always say there might be seven. There might even be eight. Who knows what uh, what will happen down the track in the, in the playoffs, but... Uh, We'll get uh, one game at a time at this stage. Uh, Christy Doran, thanks very much. Always great to uh, to chat, and uh, we'll see you throughout the year. Great to join you. Thanks, Kaki.